Welcome to Deconstructing, where we take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. I've never been one to shy away from extreme horror cinema. In fact, I have a sweet tooth for that kind of stuff. There's no film too gory or disturbing that I won't watch it at least once. But until recently, the last place I'd expect to find boundary-pushing horror would be my local multiplex. That's why I was surprised to see this particular film distributed by a major studio and released on hundreds of movie screens, especially since the two earliest entries in the same franchise were considered too violent and gross for the ratings board to even grant them an R. But in 2013, it was amazing how much the MPAA, oh, excuse me, now they're apparently just the MPA, apparently they had unpuckered their sphincters considerably over the years and extended the envelope of the R rating to allow for some extremely graphic content. <laughs> Nowadays, it's the YouTube censors that seem to have their panties in a wad over violent content, even when it's obviously fictional. That can make it pretty tough for horror fans to monetize clips and stills from their own web series. But that's a discussion for another day. Right now, with Halloween just around the corner and the next film in this franchise currently slated for early next year, it's about time I roll out a new episode devoted to this 2013 release. A lot of folks think it's a remake of the original, but in fact it's considered part of the franchise continuity and in a little while I'll explain why. It does cover much of the same ground as its predecessors and it's loaded with callbacks to earlier entries, but I was amazed to discover how well it connects with a demonic universe created by horror legends Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, who unleashed it on the world over 40 years ago. So for all those reasons and more, it's a perfect candidate for the deconstructing treatment. In case you're wondering what I mean, I'll break it down for you. When deconstructing a horror film, I come at it three ways. First, in origin, I trace the timeline of the film all the way back to the original concept. Next, in legacy, we examine how it was received by audiences back in the day, its popularity with fans now, and its place in horror movie history. Finally, with mystery, I dive into some lesser known details about the film, theories, rumors, anecdotes, and bits of trivia that might surprise you. So buckle up kids and get ready to get messy because we're about to deconstruct the splattery fun semi-sequel that is 2013's Evil Dead. really call yourself a true horror movie fan without at least acknowledging the impact of Sam Raimi's original Evil Dead. The idea was born in the late 70s, and after years of toil and tribulation for Raimi and his team, it finally reached movie theaters in the early 80s. Thanks to word of mouth and a glowing review from none other than Stephen King, it made its way into theaters and video stores around the world. The success of The Evil Dead eventually led Raimi and longtime collaborator Bruce Campbell to revisit the story in the mid-80s, this time with about 10 times the original budget and a full crew, including multiple makeup and creature effects artists. Evil Dead 2 turned out to be even more popular among fans and it also made Campbell a cult movie star thanks to his over-the-top on-screen shenanigans. Universal took an interest in Raimi's wild and imaginative directing style and he scored them a surprise hit with the relatively big-budget Darkman. That feature leaned more heavily into comic book style action, but Raimi's macabre sense of humor and flair for outrageous set pieces shines through. In the early 90s, Universal backed the next installment in the Evil Dead series, which ditched most of the scares in favor of the same comedic elements that made Evil Dead 2 a cult classic. Most of that humor comes from Bruce Campbell's iconic portrayal of smartass semi-hero Ash Williams, who is equal parts courageous and just plain stupid. <laughs> Whoa. Even back then, Raimi Campbell and their creative cohorts were kicking around the idea of a fourth installment, but since Army of Darkness underperformed in theaters, the big studios weren't as eager to keep that ball in play. That didn't dissuade them from trying, though, and multiple attempts were made to relaunch the franchise, especially after Raimi's three Spider-Man movies raked in super heroic quantities of cash at the box office. But for one reason or another, that dog just would not hunt. The fans were definitely primed to see Ash battling deadites on the big screen again, especially after the release of the Evil Dead video game Hail to the King, and Ash's return in comic book form. On several occasions, Campbell hinted that a fourth film was still in development. However, much to fans' disappointment, Bruce opted out of playing Ash again. Since none of them could imagine Ash being played by a different actor, and fans would be royally pissed if that did happen, the character was dropped from the next script entirely. But in 2009, Campbell revealed that the project was back on track with a new story in development. Instead of creating a direct sequel to Army of Darkness, the team decided to offer up an entirely new group of characters as Demon Fox 
Godfather. After seeing the short film Panic Attack by Uruguayan filmmaker Fede Alvarez, Raimi and his longtime production partners Campbell and Robert Tappert recruited him to direct the new installment. In July of 2011, the official announcement was made and cameras rolled the following year. In a surprising move, the studio let Alvarez and his team go as hard as they wanted with gory makeup effects. They were pushing to get a hard R rating, which by the more lenient standards of the time allowed for a lot of gruesome content. But as unbelievably bloody as the R-rated version turned out, they still had to cut about six minutes of footage to avoid the dreaded NC-17. What we got was still a literal bloodbath, drenching the actors in gore, puke, and slime as the characters graphically mutilate themselves and their friends. We see limbs cut and ripped off and faces plugged with roofing nails, characters are bludgeoned, shot, set on fire, and split with a chainsaw. That's not all, but you get the idea. I can't show you much of it anyhow. Thanks, YouTube. Like its predecessors, the story is set in a remote woodland cabin, and once again the horror is triggered by another foolish mortal who reads and translates the Book of the Dead, thereby awakening the demons lurking in the surrounding woods who then go about possessing the occupants. This time around, they ignore some extremely obvious warnings to leave the damn thing alone. It's even wrapped in barbed wire for crying out loud. Ash would have kicked this guy Eric's ass to kingdom come for this. Oh well, people in horror movies never seem to realize they're in a horror movie. Kunda. Evil Dead certainly didn't scare away audiences, thanks in part to an ad campaign teasing some of the grisly scenes and poster art hyping the film as the most terrifying film you will ever experience. <laughs> Evil Dead sliced its way to the top of the box office, grossing almost $26 million in its opening weekend, and it went on to make $54 million in the US alone. Factoring in international sales, it racked up nearly $100 million in all. A few years later, special edition Blu-ray releases included both the R-rated and extended cuts of the film, so fans not only got to see more gore, but an alternate ending as well. A sequel was inevitable, but just like before, years went by without any real updates. Still, you can't keep a demon down forever. Thankfully, fans got to see Ash in action again, although not on the big screen. The series Ash vs. Evil Dead premiered on Stars in 2015, and we got to see the king at his absolute craziest, with more insane antics, goofy one-liners, and buckets of bodily fluids than you can shake a boomstick at. The show serves as more of a direct sequel to Army of Darkness than a companion to the new Evil Dead, but that's pretty much what we've been screaming for all these years. That series came to an end, but much like your average Kandarian demon, the franchise refused to die, and next spring, Evil Dead Rise will, you know, rise. A film with such a strange and convoluted past is sure to give rise to some unusual stories and obscure oddities, and Evil Dead definitely comes through in that department. For this segment, I picked out some bloody bits of trivia, wild stories from the production, and a few clever references for fans who are already intimate with the franchise. Evil Dead is widely considered to be a remake or reboot of the first film, but according to the director himself, the story exists in the same cinematic universe, and the new characters are posting up at the exact same cabin we saw in the original. To support this theory, the car that transported Ash and his friends to the cabin is still sitting there. With that said, it's not exactly the same car. Here's the difference. It's widely known among fans that Raimi's own 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88, alias The Classic, makes an appearance in virtually all of his films, either whole or in part. But the one you see here is not the same, it's actually a 1974 model. Rumor has it the real classic was on the set of Oz the Great and Powerful, which Raimi was directing around the same time. While none of the original film's cast appear on screen in the 2013 version, a couple of them do make cameos, albeit in voice form. In the scene where Mia tells her friends they're all going to die, we can hear another voice beneath her scream. Listen carefully and you can hear the original recorded line spoken by Ellen Sandweiss. <laughs> During the end credits, we can hear a man's voice describing the spells found in the Book of the Dead. This is the exact same tape recording of voice actor Bob Dorian from the original film as the character of Professor Noby. I have seen the dark shadows moving in the woods and I have no doubt that whatever I have resurrected through this book is sure to come calling for me.
There are several visual references too. For example, when Eric is translating the incantations, you can clearly see the drawing of a severed hand sporting the one finger salute. It's a direct callback to the runaway hand scene from Evil Dead 2. Here's a wink to the first two films. When Mia comes across the fallen pendant that her brother gave her, the chain forms the shape of a skull. This happens in both the original and in Evil Dead 2. This image from the Book of the Dead is remarkably similar to the original movie's poster art, and that's no accident. According to Alvarez, an earlier draft of the screenplay had Mia being attacked in very much the same way as Ash at the end of the original film, but he decided to let her live because he felt she'd already suffered enough, and frankly, so had the audience. According to Eric's translation of the book, the possession of five human souls triggers the birth of a final demon known as the Abomination. In the theatrical cut, once Mia is exorcised by her brother David, the demons have only taken four souls, but the Abomination rises anyway. However, in the original ending, which is included in the Blu-ray edition, David himself becomes possessed just before he burns down the cabin, thus bringing the count up to five. I don't know, maybe demons just really suck at math. What did you think of our Evil Dead deconstruction? Did it change your views on the film, for better or worse? Do you have any more interesting factoids to share? Hit the comments and let us know, and while you're at it, be sure to like this video and subscribe to Joe Blow Horror Originals if you haven't already. We'd be thrilled to death. Wait.